All right, welcome to the second episode of Ask a Retired Pro, the uh, updated version of my Ask a Pro book, which I'm now releasing on YouTube with, with special guests and, and new updates. Once again, my guest is my good friend, Pat Lemieux, uh, who's an agent who works for the Human Powered Health Pro Team, also an agent for a bunch of uh, high-level endurance athletes. Last time we talked about how to go pro in the traditional road sense, going to the world tour. Uh, today we're gonna talk more about the privateering, finding your own sponsorships, putting your own program together that applies more to the, the gravel racers, triathletes, the, the hustlers uh, like me and possibly you. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Use my link below to save 10% on BetterHelp therapy. For me, riding a bike is therapy. Right now it's off season, so I don't get to ride a bike. I'm a lot more likely to be uh, anxious, stressed out, depressed, anything like that. The seasonal stuff hits me. Imagine if I didn't live in SoCal when I lived uh, I did one winter in Baltimore and I had really tough seasonal issues. That was sort of the first time I looked into therapy. I've been doing it for 10 years now. This applies to everyone, but I'm mostly talking to the men out there. Uh, don't don't bury your feelings. Don't deny your problems. Uh, deal with your shit. See a therapist. Work it out. You'll feel better. You'll be better. It'll also help your athletic performance. With BetterHelp, they ask you a few questions. They match you a therapist. If it doesn't work out, you can try a different one. You can swap around. They're making therapy easier, cheaper, and more accessible. Give it a try. So Pat, last time we talked about uh, how to get on a pro team, basically, we're looking at World Tour. You know, there's there's this other kind of thing that's popped up in, in North America, I think specifically, but but also worldwide of privateering, they call it, putting together your own sponsors, doing your own program. Uh, this is way more in your wheelhouse. This is sort of, honestly, like I learned a lot of it from you uh, and and you were following, we were following the the pro triathlete model where it's not a team-based sport, but it's uh, you know, here's your, here's your sponsor for this category, sponsor for that category. So I, I want to talk about that a little bit, I guess, do, do the big picture, go through kind of the categories and just like how that's structured typically, how that works for the, the influencer pros, the privateers, whatever we're calling it. Sure. So I think we're, you know, like you said, we took, I took this from the triathlon model because in triathlon, everyone's a privateer. Um, you know, the absolute best in the sport, they bag their bike and fly it individually with them to every single race. They are, you know, they might have a mechanic there, but ultimately they're the ones flying the bike around and, and checking it in at the airport. Uh, you know, this was, this is new to the sport of cycling relatively in the last four or five years, because it's always been such a culture of teams, even on, if you look at mountain biking in the, at the peak in mm -hmm. the nineties and early two thousands, these were, these were team based sports and you, you were on a team. And so this idea of, I'm going to be a privateer, I'm going to be my own mechanic, my own agent, uh, and I'm going to reach out to brands individually. Uh, this is a concept that's new. And so, you know, to think about it and to frame it up, uh, for, for cycling, it's pretty easy, right? You need to find a bicycle sponsor and what is that bicycle sponsor going to have? Are they going to be just have, are they just going to supply a frame or is it going to be like one of the big ones like Trek or Specialized where they do head to toe, right? They do wheels, tires, handlebar yeah, and stem, yep. helmets, shoes. And so really you're understanding and you're saying, okay, look, great. I'm, I'm sponsored by, we'll pick a brand here, Factor. They make a bicycle frame and, you know, they yeah. make wheels and handlebar and stem, but you, you all of a sudden can think, okay, well, this is great. Now I've got to find apparel i've got to find shoes i've got to find helmet sunglasses and then i always like to distinguish what do i need on the field of play and say you know what are what am i actually going to need to compete and and then i start mm -hmm. i just break it down and it's it's tires it's tire sealant it's i mean it's water bottle cages it's all of those things and then you've got to map it out this i can do most of the time in my head but i still will write stuff down on a white border on on paper and go hey look okay well who are the brands that i can access for water bottle cages who are the brands that i can access for tires and then start mm -hmm. working through that list and when it comes to to accessing the the brand but it's it's not about uh having the correct emails like if if you having the email of of the guy at factor for example isn't going to get you a bike deal um what's going to get you a bike deal is doing a bunch of cool stuff and letting people come to you. The outreach I've found to be a giant waste of time. Uh, and you got a lot of messages too. Pat and I have talked about this of, Hey, I'm thinking about starting a podcast. Can you help me find some sponsors? And it's like, yo, start the podcast. <laughs> and then if, if it, if it downloads, you, you have a proof of concept. And I know I'm telling you to work for free, but like, unless someone is begging you to start a podcast and throwing money at you, that's, that's what you have to do. When I, when I first retired, I had a job lined up. 
Uh, I happened to have one year on my like Mavic shoe sponsorship deal. And it was every month I picked up a new sponsor. I started that year with, with I think maybe $15,000 lined up. And by the end, I think it added up to like 80, uh, which is great. But had I gone into it being like, I need $80,000 or I'm doing something else, I wouldn't have taken the first step. We see that all the time. I see that every single day, right? Where I get I get a call from so and so, and they're like, "Hey, can you help me out with so this sponsor? I'd like to uh, start a YouTube channel, and if I could just get eighteen thousand dollars committed, I could do the YouTube channel." And I'm just like, "Look, from personal experience around helping start a YouTube channel for my wife, you need to understand that this is a, you know." your actual expense to YouTube will be only a money pit. And you need to understand and have a long-term vision that ultimately that will bring sponsorship in. But you're not going to be able to say um, and give clear indication that you're getting paid because of YouTube ultimately if you're most of the time for an athlete. That's just part of what you have to do. And that needs to be one of the things that helps make you interesting. You're going to be getting paid because you have a YouTube, you have a podcast, and you're racing well on the weekends. And so um, the, the people that can right. understand that and, and not be afraid to put in the work and, and Phil is very distinguished in the fact that he very rarely has to race. But that's obviously something I know personally that, you know, every year, really up until the last year or two, you'd be getting asked what your schedule was. And you'd say, well, I don't, I'm not really racing or having a schedule. I'm just doing cool stuff and doing product integrations right. along with it. I would make a calendar and then I would do none of it. I would just, I would, something cooler would come up that I could respond to that wouldn't have existed before. It's like, oh, I could do this event that I told you I would do this, this whatever gravel race, this hill climb, or I could go race Fabian Cancellar and the Wall Street Journal writes about it. And you want me to do the last one too. So one thing that you mentioned is, is, you know, you're looking at the sponsors, you're looking at, okay, I need a bike thing. But I think the main thing that people need to think about is the platform. Uh, so you want sponsors, what are you doing to create value for sponsors? So the, the classic now with the, the folks are looking at is gravel racing. There's no barrier to entry. You can line up to do a, if you, if you have the legs, uh, social media, I would say is a set platform. If you're just doing gravel, if, if Keegan Swenson didn't have an Instagram, he would still be being, being paid very nicely, uh, by his sponsors. I don't, I, I bet he has very few deliverables on that. Uh, and as it goes down, the, the lower your results get, the more like, okay, now it's probably going to help to have a YouTube channel. Uh, it's going to help to have an Instagram and our podcast, whatever, like your deliverables will be more complicated, more off the bike. I mean, Phil, you nailed it. I would guarantee that nobody is saying, nobody is checking Keegan's contracts and saying, hey, we know that you had to do one Instagram post a month and we saw that last month you missed one. He's winning so many right. races that he is meeting and exceeding the deliverables of everyone. And and if you went to the you know tenth ranked person on the Lifetime Grand Prix series, it's it'd be much they'd be much more critical of the deliverable sheet because they they're not being um, overwhelmed with results. I guess the, at that level, your contract is you're doing X event days, four photo shoots. Assuming that you're not Keegan Swenson <laughs> listening to this, and you're someone who's like trying to eke it out, trying to figure it out. Um, like I was trained very early on when, you know, you're doing pro team photos, you stand, you stand like this, you stand with your arms behind your back so they can see that you never like, don't be in a photo with your, with your arm covering your biggest sponsor logo. And it's funny how well I was trained at that. My wedding photos, <laughs> I'm doing this because <laughs> oh, no. I just, I don't, I just, oh, there's a camera in front of me. I, that's just, that's the muscle memory. Uh, and, but there's, there's a lot of things that, you know, when you, you're, your my water bottles when I'm taking a photo of my bike, I make sure the first endurance logo is visible. There's two logos and you can and and it's that time sort of all of it. Uh you you know, you you think about that. You just you position your your brands and your sponsors in a way that they're that they're visible, right? In the the platforms that you have. Yeah, what I what I was always taught was that you show up to a bike race with your bike clean. And that's something that's uh seems super obvious, mm -hmm. but you know, whenever you show up to a place where people are going to see your bicycle, um who might be interested in what you're using, it should be in working order and it should be looking um, you know, great and the bar tape shouldn't be all ratty and messed up. So I think that's very critical and and, and very important. Uh you know, the other piece is just now you can actually athletes can speak to the products that they're using and, and demonstrate, you know, hey, I'm doing this gravel race. I've got a choice between these two specific tires and I'm going to pick this one because and, you know, something where you can 
teach someone and inspire and create some thought for the next person who's going to do that event. That's something that's, I think, ultimately really interesting. And we talk about, you know, create, if you can create value and you can plug a sponsor, you're going to keep that sponsor very happy. The, the other thing okay. I want to say is like people know when you're doing sponsor plugs, these are obvious, right? So we, we, we gloss through photos. If Instagram becomes just one giant ad place for you and you're just posing and you're saying, I like brand so-and-so I use brand <laughs> right. so-and-so like, we're just going to forget about it. But I think, you know, athletes are getting much better and much smarter at saying how and why, if they can give real life experience and, and give a scenario how they could help out an age grouper like myself, that's when I think it's, it's really interesting. One of the things that I've learned is if you can make, if you can make the post, if you're doing a sponsor post, if you can make it educational uh, or funny, it's forgiven. Uh, you're not going to be if if you're standing there and every post is you holding a bottle at camera and smiling and there's a paragraph about it. I'm scrolling and that and that was that that's that's all too common. That's that just means you're not trying. But uh, if you can do it in a way that like teaches people something or or gets a laugh, now they're they're going to read through it. They might not buy it, but you're you're forgiven because you you de you delivered something of value in the in the how to provide value category. Uh, I'm just going to kind of pull up one of one of my contracts and this is different for everyone like when you when you get when a sponsor contacts you uh you you know you ask them what do you want so here's what i want to do i want to do xyz events i want to make this many videos um you know i would like this many dollars uh here's what i can offer to you so it's uh, a lot of brands you know they they have product they need to test they want professionals to use it in a certain environment so product testing and input so like first endurance for a long time they send me uh, here's a bag of white powder. And then here's like a questionnaire of, you know, how did that feel? How did that taste? You know, compare this one and that one. Another one is, uh, so social posts is the easy one. So a lot of times some, some will be, uh, you get one dedicated video and one, uh, dedicated Instagram post per month, uh, you know, sort of at your direction or at my direction. Some, some brands sort of want to manage that they have a big plan of here's our whole social media program and here's where you fit in others don't want to staff that they don't want to pay a person to manage you so they're just happy with like oh yourself you're going to come up with something once a month that's that's you know gets our point across that you know i'll follow my sponsors on social media and just think of like a clever way to parrot what they do i, I join their their email lists and it's like okay here's what they're saying right now here's their sale they have going on like i'm going to make sure my audience uh knows about that and then it's exclusivity. So this is the thing that I think even pros screw up that that always just was confusing to me. So like you're a pro cyclist, your job is to the the teams in these cases on pro teams, this is the difference between a pro and a privateer. The the team has every category. They own all the sponsors, but but it never fails that you'll see a guy who's, you know, you're sponsored by whatever sunglasses brand and you're wearing a different one, you know, like yeah, you're off your bike, you're at a concert, but there, there just should never be a pair of Oakleys on your Instagram if you're sponsored by Gooder or vice versa. It's it's sort of petty, but it's also like, is it that hard? Is it that hard to just and the amount of times I like, oh, I'm about to, I might be in a photo right now. Like, let me grab my chapeau hat uh, and you you can scroll through all my Instagram like I own other hats, you know, but you're not going to see them in my thing because my job is to make sure this hat is visible in every photo. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've got some great stories over the years of, of people messing this up. And I want to talk about first, I want to say, you know, the, you need to understand the puzzle that is sponsorship and you need to understand that there's in cycling, it's basically one giant Venn diagram and, and you have to decide the brands that you're going to interact with, how much overlap there's going to be. Right. And so we know that if you do a sponsorship with SRAM, they would, in a perfect world, they'd love you on time pedals. They'd love you on hammerhead bike computers and they want you on zip wheels. But if you've mm -hmm. been with them for five years and your deal was just SRAM, they might not have that full overlap. And you may be, a, you might be with a competing brand like Garmin or Wahoo or uh, Speed Play for pedals. Right. And so I think the puzzle is always evolving. The Venn diagram is shifting and you need to kind of know, and you need to be able to forecast and say, well, look, I know where this brand is probably wanting to head. And I know maybe the categories that me personally, I'm overlapping with. All right. And so Phil, you know, ultimately we're trying to deliver for 
brands and, and you're trying as an athlete and an athlete, and we'll call you an athlete influencer, uh, you, you know, you're going to be, you've got a series of requests that you've got to complete every single month. And we'll use Shimano as an example. You've done your Shimano posts for the year. Now it's two weeks later and you get a note from sports marketing at Shimano that they'd like you to celebrate mm -hmm. the release of their new gravel, gravel bike, gravel group set. You're going to just mm -hmm. post about it, right? That's a low friction thing. And they know that you're ultimately delivering on their requests. If, if what they're asking for is hard, then mm -hmm. it's hard and, and you, and you don't do it. If what they're asking for is, is relatively easy. If like, Hey, can you make, you know, a really complicated Instagram reel, uh, or, or can you do something that's like kind of embarrassing? A lot of times the, the and this is brands have come a long way, but you would get like a, Hey, all of our athletes are posting this exact thing at this exact time on this exact day. And it's just like, oh, cool. You want me to look like a complete shill along with all the other ones. And it's not going to like everyone's feet is going to have the same pair of sunglasses in the Oakley was notorious for this. That's why I'm, that's why I'm using the sunglass example. <laughs> but like like at, at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, whatever time zone, all of our athletes are posting the exact same copy paste photo. And it's just like, well, that's that's really obnoxious and that's not going to sell anything. So you think about a way to make it yours, to make it fit, but to still like, you don't say no to anything like that. No. And the other one that I just, Nike was absolutely notorious for that. Their, their posting strategy mm -hmm. was just, man, it was horrible. Um, and yeah, the, so the ultimately, and, and you know, the other one that we get all the time, especially, you know, you is, uh, Hey, we know you, we looked at the first draft of your YouTube video. Can you just please edit this one section out? And, and I think that previous in a, in a older world a few years ago, they just didn't understand the complexity of that ask. And, and ultimately right. that, you know, somebody like you, you're, you're not a, uh, you're not a production company that's taking that on, right? You weren't, you're, you're getting paid a much different right. fee. And so the service that you're providing is, is much different. And I think, um, it's, it's incredible how much that's changed in the last three to five years. And, and really I've seen now, you know, the athlete influencers, they're, they're much more allowed. They've got a much greater allowance to just go and play bikes or go and play triathlon. And then the brands are along right. for the ride with it. My, my favorite contract says like, I will do cool stuff with your stuff. Like that's, that's the good one. And, and I think that's the one that's the most valuable on the other side too. Like, and, and I don't know what that's going to be. So a lot of brands will ask for, for approval. I'm not making a commercial for you. If you're going to do that, like go hire a production company for way more money than you're like, I'm going to read the thing that you say. Uh, and, but if, if they, if it's an early relationship, if it's the first time, like maybe you'll send them the, the rough cut, you'll have it on, you know, you put on YouTube and you kind of save it as private and like, Hey, okay, look at this. Is that okay? And, and if they say like, Oh, can you cut that part out? If it's reasonable, then you do it. If they're being super picky, say like, sorry, I already edited that. So we should talk about actual money. We, we, we reference it, but I think, I think it's important people to realistically know what they're getting into, um, in the privateer world, like. What are some of these guys and gals making? What are we, what are we, what are we dealing with? Yeah. I mean, the best are absolutely making north of 400, 500 K. Uh, I think probably 500 is, is the limit. Uh, but there's, you know, I know for sure on the men's side, there's a whole bunch that are making more than a hundred. And, you know, I think that's a really positive. I'm talking about the, gravel racing. I'm talking about gravel racing. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah. on, okay. on the, on the women's side, it would be, it would be similar. So I think the ceiling would probably, you know, all in would be around, two two or three uh you know ultimately i'm just going to use keegan's name keegan is just so good if there was a woman that was winning in my opinion if there was a woman that had won as many gravel races as keegan um and was as dominant mm -hmm. i think that that's what she would be making as well She'd be so, right there yeah um you know i've seen in my experience with uh running and with triathlon the if there is a female that is that dominant, they are typically making as much or more than the men. And so I, I want to be, uh, I don't think that's the bike industry steering to pay women less. I think that they're looking at, at results and then they're, they're compensating them how they see fit. And past experience here comes from, he's an agent for a bunch of professional triathletes and he's married to an Olympic gold medalist. Uh, so you're not, you're not guessing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Phil. I think we go straight into, you know, how do I advocate for myself and how do I get paid more money and, and how could I get brands to agree to the terms that I lay out? And, and so many times in, in my years, I've heard these stories of athletes getting paid by 
brand A for bikes. They're getting paid $20,000 and they believe they are worth 60. And I say, Hey, that's great. What other, what's your other offer? I'm just curious. And they go, well, I don't have another offer. And I go, Oh, so you have a wish. Uh, and, right. <laughs> and I think that's a big, that's a big distinction. And, and the, ultimately the only way you get numbers to go up is you need to either, you really need to be driving competition and there needs to be more than, um, there needs to be more than two people in the ring. And, and that's, that's ultimately how you get the numbers up is there people are bidding for it and right. brands. Here's the reality. Brands don't like to be outbid, but brands love to hear that somebody else is finding value in that athlete. And so they, they go, right. That makes them feel smart. They go, Oh, wow. Okay, great. So I feel, I feel thrilled about my investment right now. If, if another brand is willing to pay the same thing, then I'm on to something. And, and so that's very important to understand. And, and also please understand that, uh, brands are constantly using that to assess and determine fair market value. So the best people mm -hmm. in this industry We'll take a call and we'll accept a proposal from everyone because they want to have as many um, markers in the industry as possible. So they want to see every single proposal and they want to understand what the athletes are requesting so that when they decide to put money down on something, they feel incredibly confident about the value of that. My, my personal experience from, from a lot of this was, you know, I'm a couple of years into worst retirement ever. I had three or four sponsors and they were all moderate amounts. And I remember like, I'm working really hard. I'm doing a kick-ass job. There's 80,000 people are watching all of my videos. Um, and I, my thought was like, I should make more money. That, that there, I, I feel like I'm worth more money. And I was looking at like, my example at the time was I was, Cannondale was a sponsor. And I'm like, well, they're giving me, I think it was 20, uh, and that seems to be a struggle to just sort of pull that that 20, whereas they're happy to give 5 million to my former team, taking that 5 million and paying, you know, a bunch of guys who are performing well, but but not getting an insane results. You know, so and so is getting 200 a year to get eighth. It's something you've never heard of on this continent, whereas 80,000 people are watching me win a hill climb. Uh, so in my head, I'm like, I should be getting paid more. And I remember going to the sponsors I had and like trying to get multiples of it. And, and for the most part failing <laughs> the way that I was able to make more money was to get more categories, to get more sponsors. So the, here's your, here's your wheel sponsor. Here's your tire sponsor. Here's your frame sponsor helmet. It's so like kind of spreading out. And each one comes with a different contract, uh, additional work, social media deliverables, stuff like that. Um, but, but kind of spreading it and having like, you see why these teams are, have a, have a hundred logos on the back of their jerseys. That's what that is. It's, it's, it's quantity. Um, and then you can get pickier and pickier and you can, you can raise those numbers. Um, but, but for me, it was, it was a lot of little deals that started to add up that kind of got me to a place of, of stability, uh, and, and freedom. Yep. And then I think the biggest thing we're trying um, to do is understand what each category will pay. Right. And this is, you know, somebody that ultimately, if you're in my world, you have a much better comprehension of that and an understanding, but thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, there's really only two component manufacturers it's shimano and sram and they know right. what the other one is you know providing and and they have a <laughs> right. very good comprehension of that and so that there are certain categories that i would say that the price is suppressed because there just isn't enough uh competition in that where there's mm -hmm. fifth there there are 15 bike brands that are paying competitively and there it's it's a lot more open market and so we've seen that we've seen a big for me there's been a big change up in tires recently like all of a sudden that's really exploded because everybody's trying to make the best tire possible and so that's been a fun little area but yeah it's 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 understanding what's at play and then it's figuring out how you're going to ultimately drive competition between those markets Right. The other thing to think about is the, the value of the product itself. So if it's, uh, you know, say a water bottle cage, you know, I can afford to buy a water bottle cage if I can't get a water bottle cage sponsor. Uh, but if it's a bicycle and what they're willing to provide me, they're not going to, they can't pay cash, for example, but uh, they would give you free five free bicycles. Well, that's saving you, you know, tens of thousands of dollars that you would have to spend. You need a bicycle to do your job. So it's a thing to think about when it comes to, to parts, to anything else. 
Um, and then we get into the, so that's, that, that's called endemic. Endemic means brands, partner sponsors that are in the category of your actual sport. Uh, non-endemic is, is the next tier. That's sort of like when you can get brands that just want their logo on you for other reasons. So that's, you know, Apple, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, good, good, they don't good. make a bicycle to my knowledge yet. Your, your title sponsor ideally would be a non-endemic, which is they just want the branding, the logo, the visibility there. Uh, so jukebox, they, they make stickers that go on your bike. Uh, but they're not, they're certainly not endemic brand. They're not, uh, they're not in the category of, of cycling. So that's kind of the next tier that, that, that can, and that's always going to come to you. There's no, there's no doing outreach and non-endemic brands, <laughs> uh, to, to get that going. Is well, that right? you can do you, Well, you can do a ton of outreach. You're just not going to get a ton of replies. Right. And so it, 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 <laughs> right, typ yeah, it typically, um, you know, it always comes from a place that you weren't expecting, you know, it's, you're looking in financial services and you you email 25 places and the 26 one you didn't do is the one that all of a sudden ends up in your inbox and you've never heard of them and you go great you know yeah. so i think that's that's a um that's a big one and it it really ultimately depends we you know we talked about i was at a i was at the hawaii iron or kona ironman championships this past weekend and we were talking about when ford used to be in the space right and they they came in um you know, as you, how you expect they would 10 years ago when they were there for five years and then they left. Right. So it's, it's these brands that, that make a decision and, and they find a market and then they, they typically are there for three to five years and, and then they leave. Yeah. That's because you're part of their plan. Uh, not the other way. They like someone in a boardroom is thinking like, Oh, triathlon is a thing. Let's throw money in that category. Here's the five year arc. Uh, and, and you hope that in, in a million years, it wouldn't have occurred to me to, to message jukebox for sponsorship. We talked about the folks who are, who are making six figures in the, in the lifetime grand prix, the, the privateering category. Uh, again, I think same as world tour we talked about last time. Uh, it's, it's incredibly top heavy. So there's the, if you can win, yes, you're getting paid. If you can win consistently, you're getting paid a lot. If you're, if you're in the mix, if you're one of the names mentioned, uh, if you might win, uh, those folks, a lot of them, to be honest, are ex world tour. And so they, like myself, started on third base, uh, with a certain social media following, uh, a proven level of fitness, et cetera, et cetera, uh, certain relationships with brands. Um, I think in in gravel privateering, it drops off real fast. And I'm, I'm going to guess like a lot of folks have one or two smaller sponsors who are helping them along. But uh, Lifetime Grand Prix out of the top 15, are we, are we, are we getting any paying sponsors is your guess? Very, very few. Yeah, I think it's unfortunately. I think it's grim, and and people aren't going to be thrilled about what I'd have to say about the realities of if you're in the, you know, the back half of the lifetime Grand Prix. And so I think you're certainly still. You might be able to get some some compensation, some free product, but it's um, yeah, it's not where I wish it was. It's it's highly it's highly competitive. So so I guess it goes back to the the North Star uh, that you talked about before, which is which is performance. There's there's nothing that you could do. There's no. Uh, there's no quality of selfies <laughs> uh, or, or, or YouTube channels you can do that that moves your compensation from 25th place to sixth place. No, it, there's a very clear metric and it's and it's results based. And I think it's it you know the reality is I get athletes that are requesting for for me to be their agent, and I just say, hey, can you just send me some of the results that you've done? And you know I need to be I need to know about the races. I need to understand what they're doing and. If they talk about, you know, winning Farmer Hank's road race in, you know, Iowa, like that just, it doesn't, it doesn't move the needle for me. And I, cause I know it's not going to move the needle for brands. That's yeah. When I you think talk to a brand, you have, you're presenting them with a sponsor with it, with a deck. So here's, here's all of, here's what my athlete does. So it's, here's a glossy photo of them winning a race. Here's how, you know, tan and muscly they are. Uh, on what page does it get to the social media following is in there. So you're not completely neglecting that they are, they do want that information. Yeah, so I want to. I want to. But how be, far down is it? I want to be clear. I've never sent more than a two-page deck on behalf of an athlete because there's no athlete deck that will overcome their ability if they don't have results. And so, results are always on typically on always on page one for me, and that's incorporated into just the the quick story. But it's a very quick overview because the reality is is the people I'm sending these to, they do not have time for more than one page two at the very most. And so you've, you've got to understand that when you're sending something like that around. And they already know who your athlete is. 
<laughs> well, they don't need the they don't yeah born in akron ohio yeah he yeah. represents lebron no sorry. <laughs> yeah. um all right so if you're looking for sponsors what's popular and what's not I, obviously gravel in north america is is in uh criteriums are kind of in but that's still team-based i don't think people are getting a lot of personal sponsors for criteriums that's that's kind of in a separate situation um where's where's cyclocross now yeah, unfortunately, cyclocross, which is a huge passion of mine, uh, cyclocross is going through, I think, a bottom right now. And and I don't know how long they're going to bounce on the bottom. Uh, but, but you know, you have to think about a sport that's incredibly equipment intensive. It's um, it, it, it's hard for brands to they're, – they're certainly not focused on it right now, where 10, 15 years ago, it was a much different thing. It's too bad because the thing that I like about cyclocross is it's – a fantastic talent identification tool, right? If you're a 17 year old kid and you're smashing cyclocross races, um, we know that you're going to be great at time trials. Most likely we know that you're going to be great at road races or mountain biking potentially. And so that part's very unfortunate, yeah. but the reality is, is for somebody like me, uh, as an age grouper to do it well, I need two bikes. I need two sets of shoes. I need a lot of time to work on my bikes. And, and frankly, having a business and two children, that's something that I'm not blessed with is time. And, and that's, uh, mm -hmm. th that's one of the downsides of it. And I think that you're seeing that on the professional side where, you know, even if European based athletes, sure, you've got Matthew Vanderpool, Walt Van Aert, Thomas Pidcock that, that do cyclocross, but they're after that, um, there isn't a cyclocross person really in Europe. That's, super marketable, making a ton of money. So right. yeah. It, and those it, guys aren't getting paid for their cyclocross. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those guys are they're, not they're getting, getting paid, paid for something yeah. else. And cyclocross is that's, that's their training. It's yeah. sort of, it's, it's a weird thing that we've watched kind of a shame. where like, I think in a lot of ways, gravel has eaten cyclocross um, where, you know, it zoomed out gravel kind of started as a, as a marketing thing. It was, you know, th these bike brands figured out like, Oh, we have, we met our bikes really good. People don't need to buy a new bike every year. Uh, so we need to get them to buy an additional bike. And they sort of invented the category of the gravel bike, which is between road and eventually they figured out what that was. I feel like races sort of followed that. Like there was gravel bikes before there was gravel races. So it's kind of all fed that. And I think that's, it's just taken a big chunk out of what might've landed in the cyclocross world. So a lot of the cyclocross folks, uh, mountain bikers too, Mount, you know, Keegan was a mountain biker who makes now a fraction of his money. I imagine actually racing mountain bikes, uh, compared to, to these other events. Yeah. And you need to understand that bike brands, right? How do they spend their marketing dollars? They look at the categories of bikes that are being sold and then decide to distribute money based on that. Right. And so if the naturally, if on accident, they're making less cyclocross bikes, they're selling less cyclocross bikes, and then there's less money going towards marketing for cyclocross bikes. And so some of that wasn't the fault mm -hmm. of the, that was not the fault of the sport itself, but it was these new categories and topics were, um, opening up and expanding. And then there was money being distributed to them. So th this is, you know, this is probably topic for another, we've, we've gone into something and we could talk about it more on another podcast, mm -hmm. but that's how they're ultimately how they're making decisions. All right. Thanks, Pat. Uh, this was super fun and, uh, and hopefully informative. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you. Leave a comment if you have questions for, for me or Pat. All right. Thanks, um, Phil. All right. Cheers. Thank you.